recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response, session 108 in our series. And uh, today we have a returning speaker who I'll introduce in a moment. <clears throat> and that would be Dan York. Welcome back, Dan. So um, we're going to revisit a topic we uh, visited, talked about several times, low Earth orbit satellites, uh, boon or bane. You know, it's not all bad, not all good. It's a mix. And so it's a, it's a classic kind of trade-off situation where we have to make some big decisions. We'll, we'll get to that. I'd say big decisions. I believe we in the terms of the public policy uh, side of this. And pardon me. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, we've been pr producing this uh, program in partnership with IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations Institutions, since the pandemic was declared 2020 uh, as libraries in response, focusing on how libraries are dealing with the health crisis. And then it continued on from there, a cascade of crises, one after another, the social crisis, the political crisis, the economic crisis, the, 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 the climate crisis. And the current one is AI as a new crisis, a new challenge to how humanity organizes itself and how libraries play a role. Um, that's some of the stuff we've been doing. Uh, What's the current state of that? That's what we're going to be talking about today, the current state of this, this new incredible technology. I just want to say up front, for those of you who've been tracking the exploration of space for any amount of time, this has been the sole uh, privilege or ability of only a handful of national governments to actually lift objects out of the gravity well of the earth and put them into space, into orbit or, you know, on to uh, the moon and the outer planets as, as robots, except for the moon. Of course, we've landed on that. And that was some time ago. I was, I was around at that time and it was a big deal. I, I thought we would be back before now, but, uh, uh, but the point is that uh, Starlink is not a national government, not a large, powerful national government. It's, it's a private company. It's it's basically, well, it's not one guy, but it's one guy that kind of had this vision, was able to put this enterprise together with some outstandingly talented people. And now it is, it's a business. It's a real business. And that's what we're going to look at today is oh, the, it's not just the technology though. The technology is just astounding that they can put up these satellites and, you know, by the, by dozens and that the, the rockets that take them up, they land. We've never landed rockets before. They always crash in the ocean somewhere. You know, we ride it off. But these just return and land on the earth and they refuel them and send them back up. Just startling. <laughs> but our kind of anchor point for this is that billions of people still, over 2 billion people on the, on the earth and thousands of communities lack access to the, to the internet. And, and this is because of basic infrastructure economics. The farther you are away from the core of any network, the more expensive it is to deliver services to you. It doesn't matter whether it's water or electricity or internet. It's just the way infrastructure works. And so at some point that runs out, the return on that, the justification, public justification, private justification for that runs out and there are just no more wires. And the towers, which are mostly connected by wires, also stop. And that leaves, as we see, billions of people in the digital dark. Now, that doesn't mean that that's the worst thing that could happen to anybody. And increasingly, the internet is not you know, nirvana. I say, I don't know if it ever was, but uh, it should be an option for, at least that's our feeling, is anyone should be able to participate in this this digital phenomena that's happening to humanity and 
And universal access is based on that principle. It says that if there's a if there's a basic service, then everyone should have affordable access to it. And that's how we got uh, electricity to everyone in the U.S. And that's how we got telephones. Everybody. But with the advent of broadband, that concept just sort of dissolved into the techosphere of, well, no, we're not we're not that kind of uh, enterprise. We're just private companies, technology, we're like, we're like Intel and Cisco. And so we'll just invest where we can expect a return. And that's what they've done. And that's why we've been fighting for years. And the, we, the U S and spending tens of billions of dollars, trying to extend uh, broadband to, to everyone and still struggling to do that. It's just remarkable. What will it take if the U S can't do that for, for these other people? So broadband from space is entered the picture. <clears throat> Suddenly you've got an infrastructure, a new infrastructure that just leaps over the terrestrial infrastructure, all the towers and wires. It just bypasses all that. It goes straight to the endpoint. No, it disintermediates a lot. Now there are, of course, downlinks where it goes into the backbone of the internet, but I'm not sure that it has to do that to create an actual autonomous global communication system. It seems like it doesn't really need the internet to create its own global network. So, but of course, most people use it for the internet, which is understandable. <clears throat> the, the, the point that we're gonna kind of pay a little extra attention to is not the equity of access and the health and access to you know government services, all the things that we think of the internet for, uh, but also how this capability it can increase resilience against disasters and outage, as well as the uh, the traditional access uh, equity issues of closing the digital divide worldwide. And that's a lot of that is still in the U.S. and in every place you've got divided. Uh, we two years ago we, we were intensely focused on this. Uh, we funded. Uh, we were able to acquire uh systems for five libraries in nigeria we're looking to hear an update from them uh in the next month or so on how that's gone and uh we were also able to put place some around in the u.s the the first what we call leo library was a tribal library in new mexico and suddenly they go from you know these old satellites which are slow unreliable to this new satellite technology, which is fast and seems reliable. Um, this is an old <laughs> illustration. It looks quaint today. I remember when it was new, it looked like, wow, you know, this is a total enclosure of the earth. Well, that is really just, I don't know, a few hundred lines. And now there are some 6,000 of these Starlink satellites buzzing around in low earth orbit. Uh, this is what the kit used to look like. There's a new version of it, but I think the download upload speeds are about the same uh, fast. Uh, I mean, compared to the other alternatives and on par with, you know, urban uh, fiber. Main barriers to adoption, which is kind of how this struck us, is that there's availability, there's affordability and there's usability. But without availability, affordability and usability don't really matter, do they? So that's been the point. This has hit the availability point. And then there is a question, well, is it affordable? And, you know, uh, it does work really well from the reports. Uh, I, we have one at a, a, a summer place that we have is in a rural area. It happens to be in France. We got one of these three years ago and we'd gone from a DSL, you know, crippling, crawling one megabit per second connection uh, at the far end of a, a wire line uh, to renting portable routers. The cell system is pretty good, but it's expensive and data capped. And then we drop a dish out in the, in the field and suddenly we're getting 150, 200 megabits a second with just a plug and play thing that I set up, which means it's really easy to do. That was, that was a really uh, eye-opening kind of experience we still need to work on affordability, which uh, SpaceX is definitely doing, Starlink is doing by offering different pricing points and different 
uh, economies, uh, you know, like half price or less the U.S. price. And then the usability remains a question about how people use it. These are the rationales basically we saw. It's just the best thing because there's nothing else out there. Okay. Uh, fiber's coming, but it's not here yet. And it takes longer and longer for these fiber projects to actually get out there. So it's an interim solution. <laughs> and then the other part is the, the backup against disasters. So we've done projects talk, where libraries have acted to uh, extend library Wi-Fi using a range of wireless technologies, you know, TV white space, TBRS, five, six gigahertz, uh, line of sight, kind of microwave extensions, all of these to expand access to this, this public Wi-Fi that libraries uh, offer. Uh, and it's, it's, it's been super interesting because we've tested so many technologies and encourage so many libraries to pick up these kinds of uh, responsibilities. So that's the, that's the access side. But in case of disasters, everything goes out. <clears throat> and if there's not a plan like backup power and some kind of alternate uh, communication strategy, then everybody's in the dark. And they will show up. They are. They do. They show up at libraries because where else did you go? My battery ran out, uh, you know, last night. Internet's out. My Wi-Fi is down. I don't have electricity. So what's going on out there? I have cable, but that's out too. I don't have a radio anymore. I have to go somewhere to find out. So the library is a natural place for people to go. You don't have to tell people to go. They'll just figure it out. They go, well, yeah, the library is a place where you get information. I'm going to go there, find out what's going on. And sure enough, a lot of libraries are prepared and open to help people deal with the, with the crisis. Uh, and this is the crisis of all the crises we've been looking at, including the health and AI even today, uh, and, and social and economic, so forth. This is the big one. This is the one that's going to change. That is changing everything. And this is this is like a two-year-old warning. The changes have become inevitable and irreversible. Uh, this is just a little portrait of a range of different kinds of catastrophes are hitting the planet everywhere. And speaking of today, uh, Helene is uh, moving in very quickly on Florida. This is this was just a storm like a day and a half ago. I'd say just a storm, but it was a storm, not a hurricane. But the temperature, the water temperature of the Gulf of Mexico is so high that it has energized this storm super quickly. They're now predicting a Category Four hurricane to hit the the big uh, uh the the big bend of Florida there in the in the neck tonight you know in in less than 12 hours it's going to it's going to slam into Florida and then it's going to proceed on up and it's not just the winds we've always think you know we rate these hurricanes in terms of the wind speed and that's you know the damaging but since Harvey hit Houston we've begun to look at the water content of these storms and Harvey dropped four feet of water on Houston. It had no place to drain it and just sank for for days and, and weeks. It's it's phenomenal. So the the uh, the moisture level goes up with the temperature, and that translates into rain and that translates into too much water, and we've got flooding. So this is a path that they're looking at quite a bit of influence from this storm over the next uh couple of days. Amazing. This is a graph of um, billion dollar disasters. We've started looking at these, uh, well, for, well, almost the time we started. And you can see the, uh, the average, uh, kind of the last few years, each year uh, is going up. And this one shows the annual billion dollar disasters at around oh, 250, something like that. And then you jump ahead a few years and the average is closer to 400. And then you jump again now and it's it's even higher. So this is kind of an unaffordability uh, chart, but this is this is what we've bought into. And we're just we're not facing this crisis. Um, and so there are two ways of dealing with it. Uh, one is to mitigate this and to stop 
pouring more carbon into the atmosphere. This seems to have uh, a lack of unanimity about uh, whether this is a priority or not, amazingly, but you know, it's just the way vested interests uh, allow people to see the world in a certain way. So uh, there are plenty of people with plenty of power and plenty of money that see it in a different way than 98% of the science scientists who study this phenomena uh, see it. So it's going to take massive efforts by the biggest players, the biggest governments, the largest financial institutions, the insurance uh, industry, all of that has to align on uh, uh, mitigation, changing the infrastructure to be sustainable. Well, I'm wishing us all good luck on that. But in the meantime, what what do each of us do? What, do, what, what does the community do about that? Mitigation, yeah, you can do, you know, you can recycle and, and, and do things. It, it's just, it's a drop. It's a tiny drop. It's important, but it's still tiny. What we can do is uh, develop adaptation strategies. That's real. We can actually, something that we can do at the personal level, at the community level, and one of the things we can do in adaptation is be prepared for outages and disasters to knock out uh, the the uh, electrical infrastructure. And the only technology that we've seen that actually is impervious to these kinds of events is uh, broadband from space. So this is relevant today. Last thing I'll say before we turn it over to Dan is that uh, four years ago, there was a massive hurricane that went through Florida. People, by the way, are, we haven't talked about migration, but it's a big one as a result of uh, climate change. And people are migrating, of course, from the so-called global south going north in very, very large numbers. But people are also migrating from Florida, where you can no longer uh, purchase uh, or maybe if you purchase, you can't afford home insurance. And these storms are just becoming relentless. It's almost, you could call it Hurricane Alley through there. And so people are fleeing that. Even though the weather is nice most of the time, they just can't afford to rebuild their house every three or four years. So uh, it's it's a rough, uh, a rough picture. Uh, that is facing the people in Florida. And because a storm is hitting just now, they're looking at it again. What happened four years ago, as this was happening, it came through, the state acquired hundreds of these low Earth orbit uh, dishes from uh, Starlink. And they distributed it around on the path that the, that the hurricane went through and knocked everything out. So they were able to organize a recovery I don't know what we would say pretty well, but much better than they had if they had not done that because the sometimes the cell system can you know survive these events, but if that's the only thing up, everybody is piling onto it and it becomes almost unusable. We had an event like this here in California. It wasn't a, it wasn't a hurricane, of course, but we had fires to the north up in Sonoma County. And so the utility decided they needed electricity from... Marin County, just north of San Francisco, to support the needs up north. And they turned it off. They just turned it off. They didn't notify anybody. They just turned off the electricity for, for a quarter of a million people for five to seven days. Well, we went through this experience of what it's like. I mean, the first thing you think about after a day is your your phone and your freezer. And then, you know, things start to get uh, complicated. But uh, this is, this, there's a, it, it, it's a strategy. It's a justification for a strategy to deal with this stuff. So, uh, we have Dan with us today, and Dan, I want to thank you again for coming back, and uh, and first of all for really following this uh, this technology. Uh, you you've led on the uh, 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 the uses of this technology, the outlook for this technology. The Internet Society has long been a champion of universal access. Everyone should have a chance to be uh, connected. Uh, you've also led on community uh, connectivity, community networks. And Thanks, so Tom. we're yeah. curious how how this technology supports all of those goals and what's the state of the technology. And then we can talk about what's, what's good. 
that ride with it. So thanks again. Take it away. That was a long introduction. Sorry, we've been kind of on Sounds vacation good, Don. for a, for a the, while. Um, Go, Dan. The, the Internet Society, uh, as Don said, has been around. You know, we've been around for 30 plus years working on these kind of issues. And, um, and we believe firmly that the Internet's for everyone. We work toward this. Uh, you know, we look at how do we create a bigger, stronger Internet for everyone. Back in 2022, we created a report, which you can get at internetsociety.org slash LEOS, L-E-O-S, which looks at the pro provided perspectives on low Earth orbit satellites and, and for Internet access. We were on here back in, as you showed in your slide, in December 2022, talking about that. We came back, I came back several times uh, following up on that and working with that. And we've been looking at this issue for a long time around what are these kind of issues? And so thanks, Don, for the invitation to come back, because two years later, a lot has changed. I thought maybe just a quick little you know, reminder of what it looks like. This is actually visualization from somebody who tracks satellites of what the, what the planet looks like right now. The blues that you see there, those blue dots, are the 6,000 plus uh, sa Starlink satellites that are there. The orange, interestingly, are the 600 plus uh, OneWeb satellites, which are another, they're at a higher altitude than where SpaceX is. But this is kind of what's going on. And when we think about it, this is just a little bit of a, a reminder. So we talk about low Earth orbit, which is generally referred to as about 2,000 kilometers and down. And that's where all the activity that we generally think about happens. It's where the International Space Station is, where the Chinese Space Station is, where so many of our different, you know, um, like uh, imaging satellites, so much more is happening there. Then way out at the far end is the, the geosynchronous or geostationary Earth orbit, geos as we call them. And the advantage of putting a satellite way out there is that it is basically parked over a spot on the planet. The, the zone that it can do is wide and it can cover something. And, and at that, for a number of different physics reasons, it orbits at the same speed as the planet. So it's always kind of over the same location. Uh, the challenge, as Don said, is that it takes so long for something to get out there and come back. In the middle is this medium Earth orbit. And there actually are a couple of constellations in that range that do uh, internet access, but there's also in there the global positioning system, the GPS satellites, and, and the other equivalents of those, because there are several of those, all happening in that kind of space. And so when you're looking to do global internet access, way out at the far end in, in the geo space, you could take three satellites and you could have, have access for the entire world. You can cover that. When you get closer, you need, you know, you need more. So as you get into Mio, you can get like the SES constellation has about 20. Then you get down into closer. OneWeb has about 600. Uh, Starlink is even closer and it needs, it needs at least 3,000. As I've said, a number, it's even higher there. But this is the kind of the, the where we're at in space. And the farther you go, the fewer satellites you need, but the longer the latency is, the slower the connectivity and all the pieces that are part of that. The, the terminology we talk about, satellite constellations, this whole collection of all of these, a user terminal is the name that, that is for the device, the dish, right? We call it a dish, something like that. But it's, it's more than that these days. It also typically has a Wi-Fi router inside of it, some other things. And then there are the ground stations that actually have the connection that, that goes on. And, you know, a picture we've often looked at is if you're using a Starlink terminal or anything, you're going up to a satellite, bouncing off of it and coming down to a ground station, which is then connecting you out to the Internet. In the world of LEOs, you might be going on, up and off multiple satellites. It was some of the cases you might have a Starlink satellite in view for maybe five minutes and then you're being passed off to another one. So you're always kind of going in them. One of the new things that's happened in these constellations is this ability to go and use these lasers in space and be able to connect up to a satellite, go across the satellites, and then connect down to a ground station, which means that you can be able to go and use these systems from much broader spaces than just where there are, are ground stations in some ways. Now, one of the challenges of getting these deployed is that you do have to get a lot of government approvals. And this is one thing a little different from some of the traditional kinds of ways we connect with internet, but you actually have to go to every single country, if you're an operator of these, 
and get permission to connect up to the satellites and back down to the ground stations. There's a whole range of, of uh, permissions that have to go in. So getting these deployed takes a lot of work. You have to have ground stations which need approval. You have to get consumer equipment approval to have the, the terminals actually shipped into a place. It's a lot of work. We covered all of this and sort of the advantages, the ranges, the things that were going on in that document that we published in November 2022. So today I want to sort of come back and say, well, okay, two years later, where are we at? The big number of everything is this, which is 7,062. And that is the number of Starlink satellites that have been launched as of today. Now, there's 6,371 that are actually in orbit working, but there've been over 7,000 that have been that have been launched. Some of those, the, the missing 700, you might say is, where are they? Some of them failed. There were a few launches that failed. There was one that was wiped out by a, a solar storm. There's also just some that have aged out. These satellites only have enough propellant to keep them up there for about five years. And then they wind up deorbiting and burning up and doing things. But this is a huge number. And one of the huge things is this is more satellites than we have ever had in space in the history of humanity. And this is just the satellites that SpaceX has launched. There's a whole bunch of other satellites launched by OneWeb, launched by, you know, so many of these other different companies that are up there right now. And so it's an amazing time. We'll come back to some of the challenges, but this is what's happened in the last two years. We now have these global networks and we can know this is life-changing connectivity. People who have had geostationary satellite access with slow speeds, high latency, it would take sometimes you know, over a second sometimes to get a signal out there and back, at least 600 milliseconds, maybe even more, but oftentimes more of that, you can't be on a Zoom call. You can't do online gaming. You can't do you know, streaming and stuff in some of these environments because of the latency and the slower speed. And also they're typically pretty expensive to get that. Leos have changed that. They've changed the dynamic. They've changed all of that. This is a, a story we did about a, a community way up in the Canadian Arctic that is now, they're able to participate in the modern economy. They're able to go and, and you know, learn online. They're able to connect to, to libraries, to connect to resources, to information. They're able to sell things, purchase things, all of that kind of stuff that was just not really possible before. And this was built in a, a community network, then used a connection out to, to SpaceX, to Starlink, to be able to go and, and work with that. Last two years have also shown a tremendous evolution in these kind of dishes. The you know Don showed a picture of one of the early ones that looked like a traditional satellite dish. Now we have these. The one in the upper right corner is the Starlink Mini, which is a tiny little thing. It's about the size of like a MacBook or it shows there a laptop. Uh, which you could just put in your backpack, carry with you, go anywhere, set it up, and you have connectivity. The ones in the lower left are some of the designs from Amazon's Project Kuiper, which is coming up. And there's all sorts of things happening around this. In fact, we've seen this whole world where we now have roaming. You can take your satellite dish, you know, and Don mentioned he has one at, at a summer place, but you could take that now with certain subscriptions and in the places where it's available. You can just go wherever. So you have a whole new class of people who are just able to go and live and work absolutely wherever that they have connectivity. Amazing times that, that we're seeing in this. We're also seeing a, a fundamental shift in in-flight connectivity and the ability to be, you know, access and online while you're on an airplane. <laughs> Sometimes I admit I like to go on airplanes because I'm not connected. But, you know, there are times when people do want to be able to be connected, do the things they want, do all that. We've had in-flight connectivity for years. It's been coming from the geostationary satellites or from other techniques that are there. But now Starlink in particular has created this environment where you can have, you know, these, you know, 100 gigabit or uh, not 100 gigabit, 100 megabit speeds and pieces like that with low latency. So you can participate just as you would in if you were on the ground. It's shaking up the airline industry. It's shaking up the in-flight, you know, the connectivity industry. It's it's just fascinating. There's all sorts of different 
economic models that are happening too. Don mentioned the fact that in some parts of the world, SpaceX has changed its pricing to adapt. You're also seeing some places in Kenya, there are people who are making it so you could rent a Starlink kit to be able to go and use it rather than having to purchase something up front. Uh, the one on the, the piece on the left talks about a, a company in Nigeria that's using Starlink to go and be able to provide connectivity to its remote cell site. So you could just use your phone, be able to connect to it, a community network, a community hub kind of thing. We're looking at you know resilience. There's a number of different efforts where we're talking about this. How do we provide alternate pathways in the event that something happens? Subsea cables carry the vast majority of our traffic in between continents and places, and yet they do have risks. There are problems. There are cuts. There are there are deliberate cuts sometimes. There's also uh, weather related issues. There's landslides under underwater. All of those things. How can you have backups right now? As as Don mentioned, Hurricane Helene is barreling into the into Florida. It's been in the Caribbean. Those islands are looking certainly at. How do we go and provide and ensure that we have connectivity when we have outages of subsea cables? How do we look at it in terms of um, electrical? This was the comment Don mentioned earlier that Florida, while it's preparing for this hurricane, is also noting that they have all of these Starlink that they can go and deploy. Another case in this is somebody that's been on the gigabit library networks before the ITDRC or Information Technology Disaster Resource Center. And they are an organization here in the United States that goes and deploys out. And, and I'm a volunteer with them. So I will say they are, they've asked for deployment people or people to be ready to go and deploy into Florida after Hurricane Helene to be able to go and restore connectivity. And they their, you know, their tagline is connecting communities in crisis. And they come in with a trailer like what you see. And there's multiple ways of connectivity that they have. They can connect into cell networks. They can connect into various different mechanisms. But one way shown here is Starlink. And so they can be able to get a connection right down in there, provide connectivity to first responders, to the local community, to people in, in places like that in ways that work. We're also seeing in the last two years a fundamental shift in something we didn't really think about, actually. We didn't even mention in the, in the document we wrote back in November, 2022, because it, it seemed a little bit farther out. But this whole idea of direct to device that I could take my regular old cell phone, okay? I have an, an iPhone, but it could be an Android, could be whatever. And I could use this phone to connect to a satellite. That's like crazy talk, but that's real. It's happening now. It is, it is fundamentally, it's a whole new different world because this is actually happening. T-Mobile and SpaceX led the way with this contract that they have with T-Mobile USA, but then also expanding it beyond the USA. And now SpaceX has had to go and launch satellites with the appropriate radios to be able to talk to these cell phones. And they have to get permission to broadcast on certain uh, frequencies, additional frequencies than they are using. And there's a whole bunch of people lined up against that, fighting that. So with that. Uh, AT&T and Verizon, as you can see here in the United States, are the other two of the other big players. They, of course, been fighting every way they can to prevent this from happening. But they've also, AT&T and Verizon, have, tu have tuned in with another company called AST Space Mobile, which is starting to launch its satellites um, in order to provide this kind of directed device uh, service. There's other companies. I have one here, a company called Link is actually starting to provide this service now. Now, it, they're just testing it. They don't have enough satellites up to give you actual full broadband connectivity, but they're starting with with uh, with with um, e e messages, text messages, and, and some limited calling type of things. This is all happening at a speed that is amazing, really, with what's going on with this kind of thing. The other big change in the last two years is uh, is China. China has started to launch its own equivalent satellite uh, constellations. Uh, it goes by various different names. There's different terminologies for it that we don't all understand here in the Western side, but, but there are several different mega constellations that they're building that will be on the order of 
12, 15,000, 30,000 satellites, similar to what Starlink and, and Amazon Project Kuiper and others are looking to build as well. This is a big change as well as that they're now launching their constellation. And so we'll see. So amazing times happening, all sorts of stuff. There's certainly, though, been a number of challenges. Uh, the number one is that there's only one provider of launch that's consistently launching um, satellites, and that's SpaceX. They're the only ones who are currently launching it. So from a larger perspective, uh, the only company that you're relying on is SpaceX, and that puts a certain single point of failure in things that's, uh, that's challenging for the overall launch industry. The other different providers, folks like ULA, which is uh, Boeing and Lockheed, the traditional providers of launch for NASA and for others here in the United States, they're in a transition. Ariane Space, which was a typical uh, European Union launch provider, they're in a transition. There's been new entrants like Blue Origin, which is backed by Jeff Bezos, that they're also waiting to launch their next rocket. There's a whole bunch of smaller providers but if you look at what the scale is to go and launch these kind of constellations, you have to always be launching because you've got to keep bringing these up again and again and again, because again, they only have a five-year lifespan. So you have to go and, and to be able to provide the, the capacity and the pieces that's going on there, you have to go and be able to provide that kind of launching. In 2024, We've seen so far as of today, 92 launches by SpaceX with their Falcon 9 rocket, which as Don mentioned, has the added dimension that it's the first reusable rocket that has been consistently reusable, which totally changed the dynamics of the costs. There's been one launch of the Ariane 6, one launch of ULA, the new Glenn has not yet launched. And moving ahead into 2025, SpaceX is projecting again to try to do 150 plus launches. You can see the other ones that are that are listed here. But again, Ariane 6 and, and the Vulcan Centaur have only launched once so far. So it's an open question as to whether you're going to achieve these kind of things. And this is what's stopping some of the other constellations from getting up there. Amazon with their project Kuiper has envisioned another, you know, competitor to Starlink that would have a similar kind of scope and a similar kind of space, they're just stuck without getting a, getting their, their satellites up. In fact, they've actually had to go and arrange with SpaceX to carry some of their satellites up into space. And if you know anything around that, this is, you know, they, Amazon went around and locked up 85 plus launches on everybody else except SpaceX. Because again, you're in the billionaires, right? Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, personalities and such. But this is the big barrier to some of these other providers who want to get up and launching. There's also some interesting stuff happening in the, in the world of, of radio spectrum, which is, again, how you go and connect, communicate from that terminal, that dish, up to the satellite and from the satellite back down to the ground station. That all falls under the auspices of the, of the ITU radio communication, radio telecommunication side. And it's, it's, it's then parceled out through national entities and everything else. There's a lot of fighting happening here in the United States. It happens at the Federal Communication Commission. In other parts of the world, it happens at other um, uh, um, regulators. But there's a battle over who controls the spectrum. The, it, what's happening, one of the battles is the, the geosynchronous satellite providers Back in the early days, they got a uh, concession from some of the early low Earth orbit providers because there was a range before this. Folks like Iridium and some of the other uh, Global Star and some of the others that launched back in the 90s, they had a concession that these providers would reduce their power at the, equi at the equator. Well, now a lot of the LEO providers say it doesn't, it's not needed, but the GEO providers, of course, claim it is. And there's a whole fight around that, but it ultimately comes down to at some level, the Leo providers are massively affecting the subscriptions of the geo providers. You're getting, you know, low latency, high speed, it just can't compete. And so there is all of this economic thing happening with these companies that have for years, decades, been providing connectivity through geosynchronous orbit. You're also seeing the telcos who the mobile telcos who you know say they need more bandwidth and more spectrum to be able to do 5G expansion. 
And of course, they want to grab some of the spectrum bands that the satellites are using. And the satellites are companies are saying, wait, hold on, that's all we got. Now, of course, they're now saying we want to communicate on the on the bands that the telcos use to be able to do direct to device. So all sorts of stuff is happening in this spectrum wars. You know, other things are seeing, we've had people looking at how do you provide Leo access in areas that have shutdowns or where things are blocked in censorship. There's actually no technical reason why you couldn't be able to turn on connectivity in a country such as Iran. And in fact, Starlink did at the request of the US government and other entities. But um, legally and commercially, there's a whole bunch of issues. And plus, there's issues that you can find and detect these kind of um, satellite antennas. Because unlike the traditional satellite TV antenna that you might get for, say, Dish TV or one of the, the broadcast units, it's just a passive antenna that sits there on the side of a house and receives you know, broadcast satellite TV signals. It's, it's not doing any kind of transmission. It's a one-way, a downlink kind of thing. Well, broad, these LEO you know, internet systems are two-way transmissions. So they're transmitting back up to the satellite con things, which means they can be found. So if you're using a Starlink dish inside of Iran, you run the risk that the, the government signal intelligence agencies could be able to go and find it and those kind of things. So there are you know, challenges in this kind of space that's there. We're also seeing space debris is continuing to be a, a big issue. This year, we saw a, a Russian satellite that broke up and it, it created a cloud of debris in low Earth orbit that then was going around and potentially hitting other satellites and pieces like this. There's a whole range of companies and, and UN and other government agencies that are looking at how do we ensure that we're not causing more problems? The FCC has recently said that now anybody launching satellites into LEO has to have a plan to deorbit them within five years of them reaching the end of their life. Before that, it was actually 25 years. So they've reduced that time to say, look, we need these things to get out of space and get out of space safely. There's a, a whole effort underway of something called the Zero Debris Charter that's looking at how do we have a sustainable space environment that's that's not filled with, with debris. So that satellites burning up in the upper atmosphere is a good question. You know, when you look at the scale and we get to where we have 40, 50, 60,000 satellites up in space and you go out about five years to their end of life, you're talking about 40 or 50 satellites burning up in the upper atmosphere every single day. Do we understand what that does? No, <laughs> we don't. But there's satellites looking and saying, huh, we're putting in like this. One of these was saying we're adding a certain amount of aluminum to the upper atmosphere because of the burning up of these satellites in this kind of space. You know, is that a good thing, a bad thing? I don't know. We don't know. You can go back, of course, in our history and think of a time when we all thought that asbestos was the miracle fabric that was going to protect us all until later we discovered that it was causing cancer in everybody's lungs. You know, I, this is one of those questions. We don't know. It may be perfectly fine. Maybe the upper atmosphere can absorb the level of that. Maybe not. This is an area that, that there's a lot of interest and work in and those kind of things. There's also a huge amount of concern about uh, the impact on astronomy, both from a visual perspective. If you have that, if you go back to that picture I showed at the beginning of all of those satellites, you have to think that those are causing tracks on people's telescopes, and they are, you know, and, and they're they're you know causing those kind of issues. They're also causing um, they're also causing um, uh, radioactive or not radioactive uh, radio frequency for radio telescopes and things. Because again, you have this whole sphere of transmissions that's going on. Some of these are also huge. Um, you know, this is the the uh, AST satellite. The first one is called Blue Walker 3. It goes, when it goes up there, it unfurls this massive space. It's um, 664 square meters, about 693, uh, 693 square feet. It's a huge space. You know, several, you know, it's a couple of football fields, right, that are up there and that kind of thing. 
you can see it. In fact, this was a picture on the right side that somebody took when this satellite was up there of what of how they could see it from the ground. You know, this kind of thing up there is in, in AST in order to go and do this wants to eventually have uh, 90 of these satellites up in space to be able to provide this kind of global coverage. What does that mean? What does it mean for our visibility? What does it mean to doing something? You know, we can only imagine that part of their business plan might be at some point to put the Nike swoosh on there or something, right? So all of a sudden we're looking up in the night sky and there we go, we've got floating billboards. But this is a concern certainly for, for people in this space. We also have to wonder about space weather you know, as we become more and more reliant on this, what's the impact on these systems from space weather? And this is a whole other range of research. You know, uh, the satellite companies are certainly providing more hardening and looking at what they can do to do this. But this is an area of research that we're that we're looking at. There are certainly market disruptions happening. You know, we're seeing this in some parts of the world, especially where um, this is a picture from Kenya where this, this article was talking about how some of the smaller ISPs, internet service providers, are finding that they're losing customers because people are able to go and buy a Starlink dish. And even though it costs a lot, they're getting better service and better things than some of the smaller ISPs. As these continue to roll out, we will see you know disruption. On the other hand, in some parts of the world, the threat of Starlink or the competition of Starlink, I should say, is driving further fiber deployment. So we're actually seeing more connectivity happening in places that it was harder to justify before, but they're getting it out there because, you know, as great as Starlink is, it's not close to what you can get with a true good solid fiber connection. You know, you can get, you know, sub 10 millisecond latency, you can get multiple gigabit connectivity through fiber. Fiber is really the ultimate goal. But if you can't get fiber and you can't get other kinds of connections, you know, Leo based satellite Internet access is providing amazing kind of things. And the other piece I'll mention is the concern, of course, is is what happens when China does get its its own Starlink up there and you have these multiple. It won't be called Starlink, of course, they have their own names, but when it gets it, it's equivalent up there. What happens when you have a completely space-based internet access system that is in the control of SpaceX and other companies that are there. And now you have one also under the control of China. And what kind of fragmentation will we have as, as China may then go to its partners, to people in its Belt and Road Initiative and others and say, hey, you can get, you know, come get our internet access from space, come get our safe internet in, in internet access that is blocked by certain, you know, sites and things. And, uh, and we could wind up with two different kind of internets. And well, one will be the internet, the publicly accessible, available internet. Another one will be a, a China version of that, a splinter net, as we talk about in some ways. So these are all different thoughts and concerns as two years later, as we get into a space where it's it's an amazing time in all of this with so many different kinds of issues that are that are out there as well. The next several years, we are going to see continued launching. You know, we, we talk about Starlink is completing its first generation. It's already into its second generation. They've been approved for an additional 7,500 satellites in their phase two, their generation two. They actually have, have applied for, it'll be close to 30,000, 29,000 and change. They've applied for that. They were blocked, but they were approved for 7,500. But they their intent is to launch another, to get up to another almost 30,000 satellites from there. Uh, OneWeb, which was purchased by Utilsat, which is a, a traditional geostationary provider, and they have a whole set of geostationary satellites. OneWeb is completing its constellation. It's getting um, more connectivity out to people. It's going on there. Amazon is is looking to launch its first satellites. Now it's kind of looking at uh, um, early 2025 for some of that, maybe before the end of the year, but at least there. But they're going to launch, again, initially 3,000, moving on to six, maybe 15,000, according to different things. China has actually a couple of different of these mega constellations that are being planned. Telesat out of Canada 
it just got another infusion of, of funding to be able to go and, and launch its light speed constellation. So again, all of these are happening in so many different ways. All of these ultimately, which will provide connectivity to libraries, to community hubs, to places all around the world and to individuals, et cetera. The last one is the European Union has been putting together an initiative they call Iris uh, Squared, which is a, an effort to have a European led constellation. Because again, otherwise right now, the major one is in the hands of, a U, of one single US company you know, that is a private enterprise and all of those kind of things. So a lot's happening. Stats, you know, we could have as many as 90,000, maybe even more that are that are out there. And this this link that I'm showing here doesn't even account for even more satellites that are being launched for a lot of in Internet of Things sensing and uh, imaging. There's a whole realm of people launching into LEO to go and provide imaging satellites to give us better things around that. So I will leave you again with, if you'd like to get a kind of broad perspective of this, we have a document that we created in back in 2022. It's internetsociety.org slash Leos. And, and this is where we are, you know, two years later. I'm excited to see where we are two years from now. You know, what will, uh, what will the connectivity be? Will we have even more competition? You know, I'm, I think Amazon Kuiper has been doing a lot to go and get their systems in place. They just need the launch capacity. So I think once they get all that, we're going to see their system probably deploy pretty quickly. Uh, we'll see OneWeb continue to work on this. So a lot is going to be happening over this next space. And I think at this point, Starlink is in over 100 countries around the world. And the other providers are, are out there looking to get that same kind of capacity. So broadband from space is, is definitely happening. And it's, it's an exciting time. There's going to need to be a lot of the research into these other questions, these concerns, these things. We'll have to see how many of these business models are actually sustainable. But, uh, but this is the environment we're in two years later. So... With that, I saw there was something in chat. I'm glad to open it up to any questions or to talk about anything in here. Great, uh, Dan. Somebody... Absolutely great. Uh, you really covered the waterfront, uh, the space front, if you will. Uh, <laughs> this is, what strikes me is this is kind of a classic human phenomena that, that some kind of powerful, disruptive technology emerges and we go all in on it and we don't really know what the impact's going to be. AI is a you know, current example. We're just going full speed. We're going, yeah, there are these potential issues, but it's really exciting. I'm feeling yeah, like well, this. I mean, the thing with this, though, is that this is solving real connectivity challenges, right? You know, it's it's people who have been in remote areas in particular. I mean, it's the remote rural kind of areas are the, are the place where it's the most life-changing, you know, where people have been able to go and get this. And, and that's you know, this is very real, you know, suddenly people are able to go and interact with doctors for telemedicine. They're able to go and, and, and access books and, and information and things. They can just stream movies that, they, that they've heard about, but they can never actually be able to, to, to use because they had no way to go and do that. So it, it truly, in the places it works, it's life-changing. The challenge, you know, there's the, all these other challenges we have to figure out. And I see Judith ask about the environmental issues. And, you know, this is an area, there's a number of papers out right now. Kind of the main issues are this, um, one issue is this deorbiting. As we wind up to a point where we have 40 or 50 satellites burning up every day in the, um, in the, in the upper atmosphere, we don't fully understand what that means. And there are a good number of people looking at that kind of thing. Uh, there's also just the 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 launch, right? You're launching up into the the rocket fuel, and there was a study out earlier last year that looked at uh, the compared to different launch providers, and there's different fuels they use. There's different some have different kinds of rocket fuel, and some are solid versus liquid versus kerosene versus this versus that versus whatever. There's all sorts of different kinds of fuels, and some of those have different properties environmentally and and others. Um, there's all that kind of stuff. And then you also have, you know, not, not everything's reusable. The, like in SpaceX, they, they launch and they can bring back the first stage, the booster, and they can reuse that. 
But the second stage that launches the actual satellites, et cetera, that winds up going up into space or falling back down, sometimes burning up, um, <laughs> sometimes landing in farmer's fields in Saskatchewan, as was one article that was out there. And, and so far, we haven't seen people being damaged or injured by that falling stuff, but you know, it's certainly there. So there's a number of those kind of issues that are on the environmental side, sort of the launch side and the deorbiting, what happens at the end of it? What happens with the, you know, the heavy metals, the, the fuels, the pieces, the parts, all of those kind of things um, that are there. On the space research side too, you know, uh, the astronomers of the world would love these things to go away because they are truly impacting the ability of so much of the space research that we do, which also comes down into weather research, which comes into so many different things because these satellites are, are this mesh around the world. And so if you're trying to go through that, you know, I mean, space is big. You can get through it, right? And, and software has evolved to where they can remove the tracks of the Starlink satellites and the pieces like that. But it's still, you know, it, 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 it is extra work. It's extra things. It's it's interfering with so much of the of the space research that we're doing. Now, the there's current, ways. The current interference. Sorry, I yeah. want to pick up on that about interference. That the 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 current concern are these new V two mini uh, dishes that uh, space dot com says generate thirty two times more interference, radio interference, yep. and if that, as you point out is coming right back to the earth where we have these super sensitive radio telescopes that are giving us a chance to peer in the farthest remote uh, uh, right. space and time. And, and so that's, yeah, you're right. There are a lot of trade-offs there. The, the point that strikes me, Dan, just want to make this one point. The point that strikes me is that, yeah, there are a lot of things to evaluate, but the whole system, the whole approach seems to be as powerful as it's becoming, and as more and more people depend upon it, at the same time, it, it, it feels delicate. Like you say, you know, uh, solar storms and space debris could happen. You know, this Kessler effect, we could really have yeah. an out of control cascade. We could have major uh, solar that could suddenly kind of wipe it out or degrade it substantially. And we have this potential for all this dependency to build up on it and just go away. So and, I think this is one of the issues. And that's a big concern too. And is and the other person Bill asked there, not to mention the physical risk and damage to satellites that the junk represents. And this the space debris is a real, real thing. But yes, if we get as powerful as it is, if we get to a point where, for instance, we wind up with a huge dependence on space-based internet, you know, well, what if a state actor who's, you know, what if a country like Russia right now decided that it was really, it got backed into a corner, it really gets, you know, irritated with everybody else, and it decides to go and, and blow up something up in, up in that kind of range, or North Korea or somebody else, you know, who wants to cause massive damage. They could launch something into that area, create space junk, and wind up seriously impacting our ability to do something. And if we become so reliant on it, that it becomes everything, then we wind up being seriously impacted. So there is that, the trade-offs, connectivity everywhere. I could take my phone and go anywhere in the world and be able to have connectivity potentially at the risk of creating single points of failure and other different kinds of stuff. So it's all trade-offs, right? It's all the choices that we make and, and the consequences emanating out of those. It's the power to enforce those choices, which is uh, different here in space. You just can't go up and pull somebody over and give them a ticket. It's just difficult. So we rely on treaties uh, yeah. to kind of agreements. And as you point out, almost anybody, really, a large number of actors could, you know, sabotage the entire environment. One, yeah. one device or one blown up satellite, or several blown up satellites creating a huge amount of floating debris could just basically disable the thing. And you're right. I think it's a great point. If someone felt they were backed into the corner and someone else is using this technology to overpower them, they may, you know, as a move of desperation, do that. So these are really big issues that we're, we have no way to actually face them. There's no real mechanism. ITU is, you know, they, they're fine. And the national governments, they're fine, but 
Nobody can physically turn this thing off except the operator. Well, and, and, and it's, you know, and, and there's, there's other questions around what happens when, uh, if one of these operators goes bankrupt, you know, and something mm. like that, and suddenly you have, you know, several thousand satellites sitting up there, you know, what's the plan to go and, and deorbit them or something in a, in a, in a way. So I know we're at the end of time. I would just say, uh, thank you to people that are there. You can reach me at York at ISOC.org. If you want to, you know, ask me any questions about any of this, glad to talk about it, glad to interact, engage on this, obviously. So, Thank you all for listening, and let's let's check in again in another two years, Don, or something like that, and see. Uh, maybe maybe sooner than that. Things are happening fast, uh, Dan. They are. Thank you so much for 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 keeping on this because it's a huge topic. It's a huge capability. It's a huge vulnerability, and it's something that people need to pay more attention to and figure out what kind of policy is actually implementable that works for the greatest number. So. Thanks again, Dan. A great presentation. And we'll look forward to catching up again soon. Thank everybody uh, for coming in and paying attention to this very important thing. So we're going to end the recording now. Thank you, IFLA.